Do our MPs know how to behave? Since 2019, dozens of MPs have been expelled from or had to leave their party over a range of allegations from misuse of funds to to tractor porn, who could forget that, to something as serious as rape. And as of last night, a Conservative MP has become the latest to be suspended. And then, of course, there's the Deputy Labour leader being investigated by the police. That is one of the things the audience here in Buxton would like to discuss. A beautiful spa town here in the Peak District, famous, of course, for its natural spring water. Our audience here also want to ask, should the government admit defeat on its Rwanda plan? What more can be done about climate change? And will the proposed smoking ban actually work? And our audience, of course, here is, as always, a broad reflection of the electoral picture across the country. Welcome to Question Time. Davis from the government. He's been MP for Monmouth for nearly 20 years and Secretary of State for Wales for over 18 months. Labour's Bridget Phillipson speaks for her party on education. She was elected to Parliament in 2010, describing herself then as a slightly chippy northerner. Carla Denyer is the co-leader of the Green Party, a task she shares with Adrian Ramsey. Her party has one MP at Westminster. She hopes to be an MP after the next general election and is currently an elected councillor in Bristol. And Richard Tice leads Reform UK, the party founded by Nigel Farage after Britain left the EU. It also has one MP after the recent high-profile defection of Lee Anderson from the Conservatives, and its polling numbers have been on the rise. Good evening. Welcome to our panellists. Welcome to our audience here in Buxton. Good to see you. And of course, welcome to you at home. There's always a conversation on social media. Feel free to join in. And you can catch up with the programme in all sorts of ways on BBC Sounds and on the iPlayer as well. OK, let's get started with our first question, which is from Martin Coles Evans. The conduct of MPs has reached an all-time low. How can our political parties improve the behaviour of their MPs? So I'm assuming, Martin, what has prompted you to say this today, at any rate, is the suspension uh, last night yes. of the Conservative MP Mark Menzies, a series of allegations which I have to say he strongly disputes. I'll fill you in for those who don't know. It's reported that he called a 78-year-old uh, party volunteer in the small hours of the night, saying he was locked in a flat by bad people and needed £5,000 as a matter of life and death. She then paid him out of her personal savings. So the story goes, um, in the end, she had to pay £6,500 and she was repaid, it is alleged, out of party funds. It's unedifying, isn't it, Dave? Uh, Yes, it is. Um, very unedifying. But let me just first of all say there are three cases going on that have been reported in the last 24 hours involving politicians of different parties. So can we leave that to one side for a minute because they're all being investigated? The Conservative Party has had a number of um, members of Parliament who have behaved in an unacceptable fashion. It's very important that each political party acknowledges that there's a problem, because if you don't do that, you can't even begin to resolve it. So As why did the Conservative well, Party wait three months? Because so I don't know the answer Mark, to that. Because Mark Menzies, I, I this don't was know. reported to the Conservative yeah. Party three months uh, not ago. To, not to me, so I don't know. That, that is a case under Have investigation. Have you not been briefed on that? No, no you're that's a case that's under that? investigation. Right. So there are cases under investigation involving three major parties at the moment. There are 18 members of parliament at the moment who have had the whip suspended from a variety of different parties. You, the answer, the, the question, sir, is what can political parties do? As somebody who's been an MP now for a very long time, I would say, first of all, to understand that your behaviour is going to be subject to a lot of scrutiny and your standards of behaviour at all times need to be very, very high indeed. That is my advice and has been my advice as a whip to members of parliament coming in, funnily enough, not just to conservative ones. Um, secondly, as an organisation, any organisation needs to acknowledge that there'll be some people whose standards fall and, and that organisation needs to take responsibility for it and be willing to deal with it. We have a recall petition in parliament for when people have been investigated and have been found wanting and that is absolutely right. We also uh, need to have a similar recall petition in Wales where we've had a Labour-run government that have refused to do a recall petition despite the fact that they have had Senate members from different parties who have also behaved in a similarly unacceptable fashion in the past. So that's what the answer is, to make sure to warn people that their standards of behaviour have to be high, 
to allow and welcome the scrutiny, to accept that there are going to be problems and to expect people to leave if they are found guilty of breaking the rules or letting their standards slip. And you say parties need to take responsibility. If what this Conservative MP is alleging is true, that he was held against his will as a matter of life and death and was mm -hmm. forced to, to pay them money, I presume this is something the parties reported to the police. Well, again, it's, a, it's under investigation, so I presume it would be, but it's under investigation. So let me not comment on that one. Why, why don't we just acknowledge that there have been plenty of cases involving all parties, including the Conservative Party, Conservative MPs, whose behaviour has been found after a proper investigation to be unacceptable and who have in some cases left Parliament quite rightly as a result of that. I'd be the first to acknowledge it, but I don't want to get into it, either not with Conservative MPs or with the Labour MPs being investigated or with the SNP MPs who are under some other form of investigation or any of that. Let, let justice take its course and then once people have been found to have been wanting, then you can, uh, and it's fair to discuss what happens to them afterwards. But we have a recall petition in Parliament for those who have, after an investigation, been found to have let their standards slip. We need to have that in the Welsh Senate and also in the Scottish Parliament if there isn't one there. Bridget. Um, trust in politics is really important and as someone who believes that government can be a force for good in people's lives and a force for good in our country, anything that chips away at that sense of politics and government being about that I think is corrosive for our democracy. I think it is incredibly serious and all of us absolutely as politicians, as parties have a responsibility to behave in a way that is in keeping with our role and our party leaders have equally a really important responsibility. I think what is concerning in terms of the case that we've seen in, in the last 24 hours around Mark Menzies is that it would appear that the Conservative Party had known about this for some months. These are potentially very serious matters that require consideration by the police and there have been frankly quite a few occasions where Rishi Sunak has refused to take action has refused to either suspend or remove the whip from Conservative MPs where there are very serious matters under investigation. And in the case, for example, of Suella Braverman, she broke the ministerial code and Rishi Sunak put her back into the Cabinet. Well, look, Bridget, you're talking about um, Rishi Sunak refusing to take action. I mean, obviously, you know, as everyone will be aware, Angela Rayner, the Labour deputy leader, is under investigation by Greater Manchester Police. Tessa Sama refusing to take action, I mean, she's being investigated, he's awaiting the outcome of that quite rightly, but he's refusing or choosing not to, at any rate, read the legal advice that Angela Rayner has been given upon which her, her case hinges. Why not? So Angela Rayner has been absolutely clear that she will cooperate and provide any information that is required yeah, of her by not all of the relevant authorities. Why, why is Keir Starmer saying refusing not to read because, the legal I, because I think it is right that the relevant authority, whether that's the police or HMRC or whoever else, are the people to consider that evidence, to look at the case and to then Wouldn't make a judgment. Want to know? But the, mean, the, difference here, the difference here is that Angela Rayner has been categorical that if she has been found to have done anything wrong, then she will resign. Now, I think that is an important principle. Yeah, hang on, Bridget, hang on. Look, the reality is she... When Boris Johnson was Prime Minister and was under investigation by the police, she said, he's under investigation by the police, he can't carry on, he must resign. Do the same standards not apply well, we, to the, Richard, the, Her Majesty's we all, opposition? Richard, we all know where that one ended, don't we, with Boris Johnson? So is this where okay. Angela Rayner's ended? We all know where that so, one ended. So is that where Angela's going? Yeah, no. But why doesn't the standards apply? Like David Lammy said that right. you're not subject to the same standards, which right. is ridiculous. Do you know what? I think the way that we could conclude a lot of this, how we could get to the position where the public could have their say, is if Rishi Sunak just got on and called oh, a general yeah. election. Let's hear what the public have got to say. Come over here in the front, the purple sweater. Yeah, the, I think that the issue is that there seems to be a lot of MPs who don't know how to behave. And, and why, do you also, think, why do you think that is? I, I, I think there's a lot of pressure and I don't think... I mean, you, you hear, for instance, William Ragg, who resigned the whip, but he'd already said that he was standing down for Parliament because of his mental health. Um, Myri Black is standing down for Parliament because of her mental health. There's a lot of people standing down from Parliament because of their mental health. Why is that? And nobody seems to be addressing that issue. And also, I think, to just step in on the Angela Rayner thing, um, it's, it just seems to be a bit coincidental to me that they're picking on a, a woman, a strong northern woman, a working-class woman who's raised... 
and straightens himself up and stands up for the likes of me. And they're picking on it because they think they can, and it's always white men who do it, who seem to do it. Okay. It always seems to be white men who do it. Let's hear from the man at the back. I think in the interest of balance, there are a plethora of members of parliament that do do a great job and do really care about their constituents, and I think we should always remember that. But on the other side, I think we absolutely need for MPs a really clear job description, a really clear contract of what we expect from each and every one of them, a real commitment to the Nolan principles from every member of parliament to sign up to, and standards in public life should be a really big feature of this general election campaign. But some of this stuff is obvious, right? In terms of not sending yeah, pictures of intimate parts of your body and that kind of, of thing. Work, absolutely. Carla. Well, I think there's a lot of merit in what the last person said there, that making Parliament a bit more like a normal workplace, because so many of these stories that have come out, and, you know, we've got to be honest, it has mostly been from the Conservative Party, of one bizarre and grubby story after another, is that if you behaved like that in any workplace, you'd be out on your ears straight away. <laughs> if we made Parliament a little bit more like a normal workplace in, in terms of a clear job description, you know, but also things like reasonable working hours, which would make it accessible for a much greater diversity of people to take on the role of standing for election. You know, we don't have very many single mums as MPs, and why do you think that is when the, when the hours of... of campaigning to get elected and then the hours you spend in the chamber exclude so many of those people. Likewise, you know, people with, with, with health conditions often, often means that they just don't put themselves forward because do you think, it's so unwelcoming. Do you think there's something about the atmosphere? I mean, a pitch in you, you pick, because obviously you are the, the two who are there at the moment. Something about the atmosphere of Westminster, the kind of enclosed nature of it, the kind of power plays that can go on that kind of lead to this sort of behaviour? I think pol politics doesn't exist in a vacuum and sadly some of the bad behaviour that you might see in politics exists in other walks of life as well exacerbated? and that's about, that is about wider attitudes. But do you think it's exacerbated by, by, I think by the, is, the, I think the, the atmosphere always, at Westminster? I think there is always a risk that where you have people in positions of responsibility of power then there is always a risk of abuse and that's why you've got to have really clear safeguards to the point about standards and principles in public life. That's why it is so incredibly important. I, I do have to say, you know, Parliament's still got a way to go. You know, I've had children while serving as an MP, so, I, you know, I, I appreciate what it can be like. But at the same time, I think we have made progress. It's far from complete. But actually, as a Member of Parliament, you do have um, other kind of, you know, it, other people often have it far tougher, is what I would say. You know, MPs earn a good salary. Uh, we, we do have some flexibility about how we do things. And... I think we just sometimes need to reflect on the fact that others don't always have those same choices or ability to kind of shift their work in certain kinds of ways. But yes, politics, absolutely, we need to see further change happening. But in the time I've been an MP, there has been some progress, more to do, absolutely. But I think it is that wider point about standards. You wanted to say something? How many more scandals and controversies and inappropriate behaviour is there going to be before the politicians actually deal with what they should be dealing with, which is the massive humanitarian crisis in the world, which we all see on a daily basis, and the massive domestic challenges we have in this country as well. I think there's, there's frankly, more important things that they need to be doing and need to talk about rather than um, the, the controversies and the scandals. Right. Well, certainly we will be discussing some of those. You're quite right. Um, Richard, let me come to you. I mean... You know, you've got one MP at the moment, obviously Lee Anson, formerly of the, the, the Conservative Party. You want to have candidates in every seat, which is no small feat at the general election, about 630-odd. You've got some already who've been removed for... I mean, there are comments that I, I'm tempted to, but I cannot repeat on this programme, certainly not, not, not on iPlayer at 8 o'clock in the evening, uh, but some have made comments such as Africans have IQs among the lowest in the world. I mean, reprehensible racist yeah, and, stuff. And, and that, Muslims never cause this with and us. And look, mean, every, party, every party has their, their you know, bad behaviour. We've talked about some who are elected. But you no, must on, be on, worried. On, if you've got no, to find all these candidates hang on, from hang on, a standing start... Yes, of course. And so uh, where we see totally inappropriate behaviour, we're actually the fastest at making decisions to remove people. What's extraordinary is the length of time some of these investigations seem to take. I think you've got a suspended MP who's been suspended for over a year, for three months here. The thing is to do things quickly, make quick decisions, investigate, 
and then make a decision. Well, I think you that's. Took, you took in Lee Anderson <laughs> after the racist comments about Sadiq Khan. They were Khan. not racist comments about Sadiq Khan. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You welcomed him with open arms. You're only MP, and what does he do? Racist comments. He, they he... were not racist, Bridget. You know, absolutely. You're just making. You, you've had 200 politicians, elected politicians and councillors from the Labour Party since the last general election have been suspended or have been arrested. So, so I mean, you so know, just every to be clear, just to be clear, Richard, every when the Conservative Party said that Lee Anderson's comments were unacceptable, did you agree with that? He said his comments were clumsy, but they were not Islamophobic. And actually, the point was that he spoke for millions of people who were concerned about these marches going on week in, week out, that have incited hatred and anti-Semitism. So how are these candidates getting on your list saying stuff like this on social media? Do you just not check their social no, we've, media? Well, look, we've, we've checked them and we continue to check them. And every party has this issue. The, qu the question is, how quickly you deal with it when it comes up? OK. Man there in the glasses. Uh, I'd like to ask Richard if... Um... If he supports Donald Trump. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm asking that because uh, we're looking at, you know, modelling good behaviour, good moral standards, and there's a world leader, well, has been world leader, potentially another world leader. Um, I'd like to know what Richard's thoughts are on Donald Trump. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, Donald Trump is... He may or may not be the next uh, president of the United States. That's a matter for the American people. Yeah, uh, that's my, not what you're being asked. No, my view is that actually... When Donald Trump was president uh, of the United States, the world was a much safer place than it is now. That is inexcusable. That's, that's, that's exactly what... That's there was, exa there was... Richard, Richard, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And I think it's absolute rubbish, what you're saying. Absolutely. You didn't have to... <laughs> well, sir, I was very open, but we, you, we didn't have the war in Ukraine and we didn't have the regional conflict we've got in the Middle East, did we? Right, so how do we explain to a child, OK, a, a British child, Ten-year-old child, how do, we, how do we explain to them that we are going to drop bombs, OK? Sorry, let me start that again. We are going to um, support the children in Ukraine. We're going to support families in Ukraine. We're going to bring them into our own homes here. But if you're in Palestine, we're not going to do anything. We're going to let bombs rain down on you and 30,000 people are going to die, which is what's happened. Which is... Which is why humanitarian aid is, is, is going into Gaza, not at the rate that it should. Yeah. We all know that. So, you know, that's, that's the reality. But Israel has the right to defend itself. It's okay. made some mistakes, there's no question at all. But, you know, the, the reality is, in the same way, Ukraine's got the right to defend itself. And we've done exactly the right thing with Ukraine, supporting them against right. the violent okay. dictation Richard. Hang on, hang on. I, I, I'm only going not because the points you're making are not valid. I hear what you say. I think we're getting a little bit off the subject. Okay, You'll sorry. forgive me, sorry. which is the conduct of MPs, but, of course, you're, you're making an important point. Yes, the woman there in the, in the denim shirt. Yeah. Hi. OK, it's great that we're having an investigation regarding Angela Rayner. That's fantastic. Let's also have an investigation into the billionaire, non-dom status claiming, tax-dodging, <laughs> conservatives who are stealing money from the working class. It's no surprise to me that a working class woman is the biggest threat to the Conservative Party that they're attacking her. The same they did to Diane Abbott. It's no surprise. OK, so, so the guy who apologised for his trainers his new trainers, can he apologise for the 4.2 million families in poverty today? Can he so, apologise so for that? you're talking about the Prime Minister I'm and his talking new about trainers. the Prime Minister who can stand up and apologise like he's the boy next door for his new traps, his new trainers, but he cannot apologise for the 4.2 million families in poverty. He can't apologise for the workers who aren't getting paid. He can't apologise for the NHS and the waiting lists and the people dying on them. Seriously? Seriously? Yes, yes, please. If you've got a problem with Rishi's trainers, that's fine. But if you've got a problem with the NHS, you should see what's happening in Wales, where Bridget's party have been in power for 25 Here years and given us the longest waiting list in the whole of the United Kingdom, where ambulances have to have fans built outside ambulance stations to waft away the diesel fumes, the lowest educational standards in the United Kingdom are in Wales. We've got no new roads being built. We've got 20 mile an hour speed limits everywhere, and we've got over 100 million pounds being wasted on more politicians who won't face the recall, pu the recall petitions that you get in Westminster. Their behaviour for because sorry, the you're Welsh Labour government, party. who've been there for hang 25 years, no, 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 no. We've had a Welsh Labour government running Wales separately for 25 years, and they've given us the worst public services in the whole of the United Kingdom. We are you not going to actually answer a question, though. About Did you the answer question? Seriously? We know the Conservative Party has privatised the NHS and stolen money from the NHS. We know that. You Why can't is it? blindside you, us you with don't this realize anymore. You've got, we you, know it. You've obliterated okay. the country. You've got 200... We've got, we've got over 20,000 people in Wales who've waited more than two years for treatment under a Labour government 
in England. Have you seen the one? Under oh, the Conservatives. Okay. You're not let answering me the question. You're not answering I'm going to let some other trailers. people in. Let the man there in the glasses. Can we get back to the question, <laughs> yeah, please? <laughs> and I was very pleased that my fellow audience member mentioned the Nolan principles earlier on. I think there needs to be a much wider understanding of what they are. <laughs> the Nolan when I talk to people about the no when I talk to people about the Nolan principles, most of the people I speak to say, "What are those? Oh, never heard of those." <clears throat> if we if we're going to hold people to account in public office, perhaps we need to have more awareness of what exactly those are okay. and how people are expected to behave. And of course, the Nolan principles are the principles of conduct and standard yes. life that MPs are supposed to adhere to, and clearly that is not happening all the time, as we can see. I'm going to move on, because there's lots of other questions I want to take, but before I do, I just want to tell you at home where we will be next week. So next week, we are in Tottenham in North London. The week after that, we will be in Cambridge. And incidentally, a full list of our locations for the next few months, at any rate, are on the website. So you can have a look there. And if you fancy being in the audience at any of those, or Tottenham next week, Cambridge the week after, go to the Question Time website, follow the instructions there, and come along and be part of the programme. We would very much like to see you. OK, next question from Christopher Lovett. There you are. When will the government accept that Rwanda policy has failed? So, peers rejected the safety of Rwanda bill. So this is the government bill to uh, deport people to Rwanda. They uh, rejected it for the fourth time last night. So it's going between the House of Commons, House of Lords, and back and forth and back and forth. Bridget. Uh, never. I don't think the government are ever going to accept that what they've set out is not only a, a policy that is totally wrong, but is completely unworkable, is a scandalous waste of taxpayers' money. Nearly half a billion pounds being spent on 300 people, um, where you know there have been, we've been promised this. This legislation has been going on and on and on. It is not the way to tackle this problem. We do need to clamp down on the smuggler gangs. We absolutely need to stop that at source. This is not going to clear the backlog. This is not going to stop the inappropriate use of hotel accommodation. And this will not deliver a more humane system overall. So I would just say to the government, there are ways that they can sort this. Rwanda is not the way to do it. And they blame everybody else for the delays, for the problems, for what we have seen. They've been on at this for, I think, almost two years now. They could have passed all this legislation. I'm sure David will go on to say it's all because of the Labour Party that this hasn't happened. The reality is they've got a majority both in the Commons and the Lords. This is their failure. It's not going to work. Adopt Labour's plan, crack down on the gangs, work with the French, get it sorted out. OK, can I just ask? Um, because there's generally a convention in the House of Lords, mindful that, that the peers are not elected, that they will reject and reject and reject a piece of legislation that comes and comes, and then in the end, they, they, they tend to give in. Yeah. Is, is your understanding that Labour peers are going to do as they do usually, which in the end, they will let it go through, or are they actually going to continue to object to it? Uh, my expectation is that the legislation will pass. As I say, the government have a majority. But will, in both are Labour peers going to give in in the end? Well, just to be clear, this is not simply a question of Labour peers because we don't have a majority no, in no, the No, no, I appreciate that. But since you so are here is, for yes, Labour, I'm just asking about the Labour peers. Uh, absolutely. And a number of the amendments that have been put down have involved senior military figures, for example, raising serious no, concerns no, about the government's Labour approach. The legislation I'm just asking the, about the Labour peers because you are here for Labour. The legislation will pass, absolutely. I, I so think there's no question about this. It is right that we have proper scrutiny of any legislation, especially legislation of this magnitude. But the reality is the government chose not to bring back the legislation before Easter. In fact, they'd previously said they could have done it all before Christmas. So they haven't managed the scheduling of this. It is so not down to the Labour they Party. Haven't fast enough. No, what I'm saying is when they blame the Labour Party for the delays in passing the legislation, the reason for those delays in getting through their legislation, they support that they have the numbers to deliver is because they haven't scheduled the business. So whatever they say, it's down to them. But no, right. we don't support it. We don't think it's the right approach. But I have no doubt that the legislation will sadly pass. OK. Uh, obviously, uh, Dave, I'm going to come to you. Richard, let me come to you now. Will the government accept their Rwanda policy has failed? Do you support it? No, I don't. I think the whole thing is a ridiculous farce. The only thing that's going to Rwanda, frankly, we've sent three home secretaries there. We've sent about 300 million quid. Um, whether or not the legislation passes is irrelevant. The question is, is it a deterrent? And we all know the answer to that, no. We know that uh, people on the coast of France, they've already described the thing as a complete farce, and this year alone, we've got over 6,000 people have crossed the channel illegally. Tragically, at least 10 people have died, and this policy is a complete distraction. It's a total waste of time. 
You've wasted taxpayers' cash, the energy, the resources. Nothing will... Nothing, it's not a deterrent. It OK, won't so work. what would you do? Come on, Reform UK. No, you want to put all these people in for the general thing. election. Look, Bridget talks well about the gangs. It's a bit like, when you remove a drug dealer from the streets, guess what? <coughs> Another drug dealer replaces them. So your policy about the smugglers, nice idea. No, I'm asking you what Not you would yeah, do. Yeah, I'll tell you what I'll do. The only thing is what the Australians did. You have to safely pick up and take back to Dunkirk and Calais, which we're entitled and legally allowed to do under two international treaties and under French domestic law. OK, so let me just... Let, let's just no, hang on, hang on. Let's understand how that would work. So, so say, say people are coming over on, on, in dinghies either in the, in the channel or on British shores, you would pick them up, put them in a boat, no, what, what, and then mean? take them back and what, just dump them on the beach in France. What you do is what the Belgian authorities did, which is why boats are not leaving from Belgium, because the Belgian authorities said, right, we're going to pick them up, and therefore uh, they took them back to the French shore. We're legally entitled to do it. How do you we think the French would take that? Well, the, the reality is it's under international maritime law. We're allowed to do it, and we should do it. It's what the Australians did. It's a variant of that. We know it works. Australia did it 10 years ago. They got some flack from the lefty lawyers and the international community, but it works. So let's do what we know so they had an agreement also, with the island where they went. Also, the would you have an agreement with France that would accept them if you just turned up in your boat and you said, here you are? We're legally entitled to do it, and that's the safe thing to do. It's the kind thing to do. It'll stop people dying. And then in the Mediterranean, EU leaders need to do exactly the same thing, because otherwise, 2,000 people in the Mediterranean are dying tragically all every right. year with the same process. Woman in this stripy T-shirt. Very little enthusiasm for, for, be, for people being sent to Rwanda, but I haven't heard the major parties say what, what, what the alternatives would be. People are, are negative, <coughs> negative about, um, about the, the flights to Rwanda. But yes, Richard said, but I'd like to hear what the other well, panel Well, obviously, Bridget has, has said what, what Labour would do. Yes, You've I'd, heard what Richard I'd like would... to hear what the other... What OK, the now other... I'm going to get to them. Right, I right. mean, do you support the Rwanda policy? No, no. You don't support it either? No. OK. Do you have an idea what should be done? Well, I think returning them to, to the country if they, uh, um, if, if they don't have a legal right to be here, because it, it seems unfair that the people that are getting in legally are discriminated against. OK. Man uh, in dark blue sweater there, yes. Um, surely, using Richard's um, um, analogy, that surely the, the way to stop the people smugglers is, is to make sure that there are legal routes for people to c come into t t to the UK. <laughs> Man there in the glasses. Richard's right in saying that it's not a deterrent, it's not going to work. I think this is a European problem, not just a uniquely a British problem. And we need to work with European partners in finding out why people are coming and address the issues in their home countries through aid work. We've cut aid to countries like Yemen, to Afghanistan. We've cut aid to those countries. So but some of it would mean, would mean here. stopping their wars. I mean, do you think that is something that realistically that, that outside countries can do? Yes, uh, absolutely. Global influence, it, it's... That's what we have to do. We have to give people a reason to stay in their home countries. And I think our aid budget is what can do that, but we've cut it. But we also need to work with Europe for this. It's not just a British problem, it's a European problem. And, and one that European countries are grappling with, as you say. Mm. Carla. Well, thank you, Christopher, for your question. And also for those last two points, I think the three of you between you have really hit the nail on the head. The Rwanda policy will be a point of national shame if it's allowed to pass. And as uh, our one Green MP uh, and, our, and our two members of the House of Lords have been fighting against it at every opportunity on its way through the House of Commons and the House of Lords because it is, it is inhumane, it's, it's callous, and it's an incredibly expensive way to be cruel. The estimates are that it will cost the government £1.8 million per asylum seeker to deport people to Rwanda. Think about how much better we could spend that money if instead we had an approach of recognising that people who are risking their lives in small boats crossing the channel... <laughs> exactly. People who are risking their lives crossing the channel in small boats, they're not doing that for a laugh. They're doing it because they're in danger. They're doing it because they're fleeing for their lives. And what we need to do as a country is show them a bit of humanity. What that looks like is providing... <laughs> What that looks like, as the person up here said, is providing safe and legal routes so that asylum seekers can apply from where they are, and also making sure that the UK government takes its responsibilities seriously in terms of providing international aid. So the UK government has cut its international aid budget and, worse still, is spending a substantial amount of what's left on 
warehousing refugees in hotels and barges rather than on actually providing international aid to help tackle some of the crises that are causing people to have to seek asylum in the first place. Carla, that's and all very you... well, but people... That's all very well. But, but people are dying every week, every month, as we allow this to carry on. And until we stop it and have the courage to show some leadership and pick up and safely take back, this will go on and more people will die. And it's unacceptable. So I don't want people crossing the channel in small boats because I don't want them risking their lives to do so. I want them to be able to apply for asylum safely from where they are and for their applications to be processed quickly and for fair decisions to be made. I mean, in the 14 years that we've had the Conservatives in government, the waiting list for asylum seekers to wait for their decision has got longer and longer and, and longer. And, Carla, let me and ask I you... I can't help wondering if that's deliberate, to create and, this crisis and, and get let, people upset about it. Let me ask you, with, with safe and legal routes, and that's something I know that Labour have talked about as well, are you envisaging a, a, a limit to the numbers of people that the UK would accept through safe and legal routes, or are you just saying, as long as your asylum claim is valid, you can come? I think it has to be decided not on an arbitrary number, but on the severity of the cases. If someone has a legitimate claim to asylum because they are in danger, they're being oppressed, they're, 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 their lives or their families... They're escaping lives are climate in danger. change, which is something we could be facing. So, well, so, so no matter how great the number of people... Is, but it has with, to be with a, with a, with a legitimate well. claim, no matter how many there are, they should be able to come. So Carl, to, hang on, let, let's hear an answer to that, Richard. But there has to be international cooperation as well. No, but, but, no, but as far as the Greens are concerned, just to be clear, no matter how great the number is, as long as the claim is legitimate, you, the Greens believe they should be able to come. Well, this isn't a standalone policy. As I said, this is making sure that people can apply through safe and legal routes and taking like really serious measures to reduce the flow of people needing to claim asylum by helping to tackle those issues. As you said, climate change is going to increasingly become a major factor that will cause people to have to migrate because big areas of the world are at risk of so becoming you, I, I get that. It's, it's a so two-handed policy. Prevent... So you need to do that as well. But as far as, as far as the people who have a legitimate claim who do want to come, irrespective of what's being done in their country, they can come. It, it, look... It, I so just it's millions don't think of people. It's it's, where, Carla, where are we going to put millions of people who've got a legitimate claim in your eyes, and then when they're denied a claim, which is obviously going to happen, and therefore they continue to come across the boats, what do we do then? You've set up your safe and legal routes, which, by the way, we've already got some safe and legal routes. Only so, for a couple so then, of national. If, if they get rejected and they still come across the waters, what do you do then? So you have to assess people's claims and, and you know, some so we're of them are... back to square one. OK, it's all right, OK. But the fact well, is, let me just say, the fact is that I think it's over 80% of asylum claims are successful. So there and, just and, isn't this, okay, wave on, Richard, of, of this wave of unjustified asylum seekers. That, you know, the vast, vast majority of people are coming here because... They are escaping terrible situations, and I think it is okay. right. Well, no, okay, no, no, Richard, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, Look, because the of representative all, of the government yeah. is sitting here very quietly, thinking I mean, he's getting off very lightly. And the fact is, the I question mean, is, I mean, when will the, the government here, accept the that their Rwanda policy has failed? Can I, can I first of all start by saying, fifty thousand people a year coming over illegally in small boats, risking their lives, some of them are dying, is totally unacceptable. There are already safe routes for people to come over. Not um, for all we're of already them. working. Not for all of them, we're already okay. not for everyone. No, but there are safe routes to come into this country. We are working with the French. We are working to smash the criminal gangs. But it isn't enough. It's unacceptable that people are able to come over here illegally. And the majority of these people are young men. So it isn't families. It isn't people fleeing oppression. If you actually look, and I, I went and looked at the old uh, camp in Sangat. The vast majority of these people are not families. They're young men who are coming over here, and they told me themselves because they thought they could get a better standard of living. And that's why we need a better deterrent. That's why we need Rwanda. We need those flights taking off. We need the law, the peers to stop trying to oppose it, and the courts to stop trying to oppose it. We're going to bring it back uh, on Monday. And we need to, you know, we need to look at what Labour would do. They want to basically support an open doors policy. Your Absolutely government, your rubbish. government in Wales, no, forget, I know people who don't realise it, but in Wales we have a Labour government. And as far as this is concerned, they're yes, encouraging people. They're encouraging to people to come over to the United Kingdom. No, they, no, no, you're wrong there, Bridget, because they're actually paying universal basic income to some people who recently arrived asylum seekers. And they wrote to me as a minister, your Labour minister, 
wrote and said that asylum seekers in Wales should be exempted from contributing towards their own legal bills because you wanted to use taxpayers' money to allow recently arrived asylum seekers to sue the British government so that people could actually stay here for longer when they didn't have a valid claim. And that's why your government is not to be trusted on this policy. You've voted it down at every opportunity. You're quite happy to have an open doors policy. Absolute and you're quite happy in Wales. Garbage. You're quite and happy you in Wales to pay it. up to £20,000, Bridget. £20,000 to recently arrived asylum seekers. You are just I will let making... You, I will right, let well, you we'll see afterwards we because I'm, we, I'm going to be asking see, my office indeed. to tweet right now the reports about this on oh, the BBC. Okay, your £20,000 payment. Let's hear so your answer. Hopefully everyone will be able to get their phones right, out well, and hang on. look at what you've We've actually got done in here. Wales. Let's let Bridget you're a disgrace, uh, Bridget, and your policy is an absolute disgrace. And you ought to know what your own Labour government Hang on, can I just say, can I just say... So much for standards in public life. Can I just say, on this programme, and I feel strongly about this, and I'm not joking, I don't think we should be calling people individually a disgrace. I I'm not sure that that is the kind of political discourse that we want. I'm just saying... Bridget, would you like to ask? Behaviour disgraceful is one thing. Calling an individual person who's come not, on the panel a disgrace well, Bridget, uh, Bridget, is, is not what I want to encourage. Shadow Minister should not be coming okay, on here Bridget not answer. knowing what her own political party well, is doing, where it's in government in Wales. And you do interrupt me rather uh, a lot yourself, if you don't mind me saying. I'd, I'm not complaining about interrupting. I'd be the last person to complain about that because I know I do it a lot. I'm simply saying how we refer to each other on the panel. We want to have a discourse where everyone can make their points. Okay, and it's be disgraceful heard. that Bridget doesn't know what her party okay, is doing in government in Wales. Let's let Bridget answer. I honestly don't know where to begin with that ludicrous nonsense that we've just heard. It's uh, genuinely, I, d I don't. But what about the no, point no, that I will, was I will, no, about no, Labour no, in no, Wales? No, no, I will come on to that. I will. We started this programme with a discussion about standards in public life and how we <laughs> treat them. And I am more than happy any day of the week to debate the merits of policy. But I'm afraid it's pretty hard to discuss outright lies when people just make things up. And what you have we'll just see. been talking about there, look, your party has been in government in Westminster. Can I finish? I'll finish if you don't mind. Has been in government now for 14 years in Westminster. 14 years you've had. And what a blooming mess you have made of this asylum and immigration system. <laughs> And beneath you. Specifically, what David said about Labour in Wales. It's got what if that no, was a lie? It has absolutely no bearing on the Rwanda it policy, lies. which is a matter that is being which dealt Which bit of it was untrue? But the Rwanda policy is a matter for the government in Westminster to respond to, not for the government in Cardiff. So it would be I mean, wrong, a, wouldn't it? And, it would be wrong, Bridget, David, to pay £20,000 a year not, to recently David, arrived asylum seekers. You, you agree it would be wrong to do that? Send me whatever tweets you like after the programme. It would be wrong, wouldn't it? Because it would be a crazy thing to do, wouldn't it, right, Bridget, to pay £20,000 a year, taxpayers' money, and then ask the I, I just, I, I give up, yeah. David, David, I can't reason with you. I give up. I give up. There is just no dealing with this level of nonsense, I'm afraid. This is a matter that is being right. dealt David, with in Westminster. On. The real question is, is it a deterrent or not? And the truth is, I mean, hands up. How many people think this is going to be a deterrent if it goes through? Hands up. Does anybody think this is a deterrent? Hands up. Who thinks it's not a deterrent? Bingo. David, there's your answer. Yeah, Get a grip all things, Richard. It's not whether people in the question time audience think it's a deterrent. It's okay. whether people it's waiting in town right. to come over wasting, here David. Okay. They will see it as a deterrent. I'm going to move on. Let's take a question now from Vish. Vish Mehrad. There you are. Given record rainfall in the UK and now floods in Dubai, what do we need to do to combat climate change? All right. Well, Carla, let's start with you. Yeah, the news has been full of pretty alarming evidence that climate change is not a concern that is going to come down the track at some point in the future. It is here right now. Um, and the best time that we could have brought in the policies to tackle this was, of course, decades ago. We've, we've known about climate change my whole life. Successive governments in the UK and internationally largely failed to do that. Um, so the second best time to do it is right now. And that's why I, it's why I joined the Green Party, it's why I'm standing for election to be an MP in my home city of Bristol, because I recognised, you know, I, I'm an engineer by background, I didn't want to be uh, a politician. I'm in this because I realised that the people in power making the decisions were not making the right decisions to tackle this crisis. And so I'm trying to get elected so that there can be a few more Greens in Westminster to pull whoever forms the next government in the right di direction to make sure we have the right policies on everything from renewable energy to insulating people's homes so that everyone has a low carbon but also 
you know, cheap to heat and warm and comfortable home. The thing is the technology, you know, I know as an engineer that the technology is pretty much there. The technology isn't the barrier. The barrier is the policies and the political will, and we can do something about that with how we vote. Well, I mean, at the moment, there's one Green MP, uh, Caroline Lucas, who will be standing down. So you are hoping to, to become an MP at the general election. We have got a government where Greens are in a coalition with the government. That's the Scottish government. And only today, they announced they are scrapping a target, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 75% uh, by 2030. Now, that is where the Greens have actually got some say, and it's not working. So, first of all, the Scottish Greens are an independent party from the Green Party of England and Wales. So, sure. please, but they have got please green. do have them on too. I get that, um, but nonetheless, but they have got green in their name, yeah, and their raison d'etre yeah. is to I combat was, climate change, and I it's not working. I was just about to say, yep. Um, of course, although they're an independent party, we are supportive of what they've already achieved in Scottish Government, and supportive but clearly of their not as well. So, the announcement today... Um, was, was, was changing the way the targets will be done towards multi-year targets, recognising that the policies that tackle climate change don't tend to take effect in terms of reduced emissions within a single year. So okay, well, that's one way of putting it. Budgets. Another way of putting it is, is, is acknowledging the fact that they're just not going to make it by 2030 by reducing it by, was it 80%, I think, so they've had to reduce their ambition, not just the Greens, obviously the SNP as well. Yes, and it is, you know, the, the, the Greens are the junior partner there, so they don't have complete control over what the Scottish Government have, have done. But uh, the Scottish Greens in government have achieved great improvements in terms of decarbonisation in the few years that they have been in government. So the Climate Change Committee, um, who are the ones that produced a report saying that, unfortunately, this interim target is going to be missed, that report specifically highlighted the work of one of the Scottish Greens ministers, Patrick Harvey, for the work he's done on decarbonising people's homes through housing installation and installing heat pumps. They pointed to that as an example of good practice and said that the other Scottish ministers should learn from that and how they can decarbonise in their portfolios. So, yes, it's a, it's a huge point of regret that for the Scottish Greens and I think for the whole of the UK that the interim target for 2030 is no longer achievable. However... The, the, the final target for, of the Scottish Government, which is net zero by 2045, is still achievable. Remains. And I think especially with the policies that the Scottish Government have announced today around tackling the harder to decarbonise sectors like agriculture okay. and transport, with some really good policies about making public transport better and retargeting uh, subsidies that farmers receive towards helping them to do more climate and nature friendly farming, that will get us on the right course. And okay. I think that, frankly, the UK Government could stand to learn a lot from what the Scottish okay. Government are doing on this. So, Richard, the question is, what do we need to do to combat climate change? Yeah, and look, we all care about the environment, but the climate has changed for millions and millions of years. That's the reality, way before man-made CO2 emissions. And so, let's, let's just be clear. Are you denying that climate change has changed <laughs> exponentially quickly in, in the climate, relatively recent on, years, the climate of has man always changed. Emissions. And if we look at the so IPCC, no, hang on. So answer my question. <coughs> what, sorry. The sorry. question is: Are you saying that this is just a natural course of events, and that man has nothing to do with it? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that yes, we've had man-made CO2 emissions for about 200 years, and there's no question that's contributed towards it. But there's no evidence at all that if you get to net zero CO2 emissions, that all of a sudden the power of the sun, the power of the sea, the power of volcanic activity is going to stop. I mean, the IPCC itself, Carla, says that if you get to net zero literally tomorrow, sea level rise will continue for how long? Rich, Between what? 200 and 1,000 years. So the better thing to do is to adapt to the changing climate. That is the smart thing to do, and it's a lot less costly than the current route to get to net zero, where there's no evidence it will stop climate change. Rich, and the countries that are going to be underwater, how do they adapt? The, no, no one's going to be able to... So, so let's take an example, Carrie. Let's, let's take an example of the Maldives that we were told would sink underwater. The Maldives now is 35 square kilometres bigger than it was 30 to 40 years ago. It's about adaptation. Where you're worried about sea level defences and flooding, you build the defences. That's the smart thing to do, and it's a great deal less costly than trying to stop the power of the sun, which you clearly can't do. So you've got to be smart about this, adapt it to It might kill change. their tourism industry, I hate to say it, the Maldives. You only put defences around the beaches, but I just... Just, just, just it's, a called, it's called reclamation, and uh, they've, they've, they've built some extra land, and they've, they've reclaimed land, and you've had siltation. That's how it happened. So you've got to adapt to climate change as opposed to thinking you can stop it. 
can I ask it, Richard a question? What's your science background? <laughs> um, what makes you think that you understand how climate change works better than all are, of the world's scientific are, experts there are, combined? There are plenty the of scientists who believe that climate change has, has always gone on and always will and don't think that net zero will stop. Where is the evidence that if you get to zero CO2 emissions, climate change will stop? Well, it's The right IPCC there. doesn't think it's it will. A, it's an overwhelming majority of all the world's experts on climate science understand. I think what they're saying is it's going to get worse, Richard. I think that's the point. They're saying it's going to get worse and then how will we cope with it? Tell me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. Well, the IPCC yeah. says that sea level oscillation, sea level rise will not stop for over two hundred years. But so do you understand to to why it. that is? That's because the climate that, uh, sorry, the carbon that's already going into the atmosphere will continue to have an effect for hundreds of years. It's not that going to net zero so, doesn't have a benefit. So we're better to adapt to it and build the defences rather than okay. think that we can stop You've it. You've made Both. your point. Let's, let's, let's hear from the audience. Yes, the woman there. Yeah, the, the government haven't got a grip on any of this. We have an electric car. We head up into the Peak District. It immediately flashes up. Charge your car. No p charging points found in the locality. So th that's one thing. Our son has the, the, the hydrogen heating system and cannot get anybody to repair it. They have to travel 50 miles. That's the nearest person that will repair. The, the solar heating, solar panels, uh, they, they could put them on all the supermarkets, we could, we could put them everywhere, but the government are allowing great big farms, uh, the, the farmers' fields to be covered with them, to make money where, for, for, for business and, and corporations. So the government just have not got a grip on anything to do with climate change. Plenty of other examples, that's just three. OK, I'll let you respond, I'm just going to come around the audience a bit more. Yes, woman there in the glasses. Unfortunately, one of the reasons why this country can't afford the green policies that we would really like is actually following Brexit, we have a 4% drop in our GDPR oh, and um, the country is much poorer following Brexit. OK, Richard, I know you are gagging to come in on that, but just to keep it on climate, I will keep on that if, <laughs> if, if I may. Yes, the man at the back, I think you've got a red shirt on, yeah. As an island nation with about 8,000 miles of coastline, <coughs> why aren't we generating more from tidal? Why don't we generate more from tidal power? OK, and the, at the very back. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think, to be quite honest with you, while we've still got people such as Richard um, in this country that even refuse to acknowledge that climate change is happening due to our own... That's not what I said, sir. I said it's been own... happening for millions of years. Come well, on. No, because, <clears throat> quite frankly, human activity is a direct reason why climate change is, a, is occurring on the level that it is. And because you're refusing to acknowledge that, we won't get to the point and we won't find a solution. And until we find a solution, Honestly, you know, you can relocate Westminster because London will be underwater, as will Liverpool and as will most of the cities where people okay. live. Uh, David, what do we need, given that record rain for the UK, and my God, we are fed up of the rain, aren't we? Mm. Uh, and the floods, extraordinary floods in Dubai we've seen, which can't be linked necessarily specifically and solely to climate change, but nonetheless, it's accepted that climate change exacerbates the likelihood of such things occurring. What do we need to do to combat climate Well, for most of the technologies that we'll need to adopt, we're going to need very large amounts of electricity, which is why I'm staggered that Carla and the Green Party are not supportive of nuclear power, because that actually is the only way that will ever generate enough ele electricity to solve some of the problems through the technology, such as the lady was talking about her electric cars, that need to be able to make hydrogen through electrolysis in order to uh, run HGVs, the heat pumps, the uh, ground source, air source heat pumps. We need a lot of electricity for this, a lot more than we've got at the moment. So we need nuclear power, that's the first thing. We can also um, build on uh, um, what we've got using offshore wind, floating offshore wind, which is an emerging technology. Um, and we're doing that. There's been a huge increase in the amount of renewable energy that, uh, that is used to generate electricity under this government. Um, but, you know, we're going to continue to need gas and oil uh, for the time being. And that's why it's so important that we continue to extract oil and gas from the North Sea. And I'm afraid, you know, once again, Bridget's probably not going to like me pointing out what Labour's policy is, but your policy is to stop taking oil and gas out of the North Sea, not to renew the licences, which is going to cost at least 100,000 jobs. 
and mean that we become more reliant on foreign countries for the oil and gas that we're going to continue to need for the next couple of decades. And I'm afraid I know you don't like it. I mean, it, the oil and gas is do... going to be sold on the open market. Well, the gas... Other countries will be in a queue. Yeah, but the gas doesn't. Them. The gas goes into the, into the pipelines in the UK, right? Because, because gas isn't that portable. The only way to move gas around is to, is to condense it into LNG and send it across the world. Which, which but again, happens. you know, what we're not going to uh, do uh, under a Conservative government is what we see again in uh, Labour, uh, in Wales under Labour, where we see no new roads being built. That's one of the policies. No new roads ever to be built David, you again. Have anything we positive see... to say about what your government no, no. are actually Bridget, doing? I'm just pointing out, I'm just pointing out what your government are doing. I'm just part, we can, we can talk about my government. I've just spoken about it. But no new yes. roads ever to be built again. Taking 20% of agricultural land. 20% of agricultural land is being taken aside. Can I just finish, Bridget? Sorry if I, you know, I know you don't like people interrupting. I don't like it either. 20% of farmland in Wales is being taken aside and used for planting trees and wildlife schemes and you've just brought in legislation to allow road tolling on the motorway. So that is the blueprint that you have for the rest of the United Kingdom. And if we can't even grow our own food because, it's, um, because the land is covered with trees and wildlife schemes, we're not going to be able to solve the issue of, uh, of food security either. Right. I'll, I'll come back a step and just go back to the question where we began. Um, Climate change is a really big challenge that we face as a country and a challenge that we all of us face internationally. I, I do worry that it feels often so overwhelming, the scale of what we're facing, that we do then have to focus on the changes that we can make and the role for government in delivering that. And I do think, to the, to the point about jobs and skills and what we need to do, there is a really big opportunity for us as a nation to deliver lots of really well-paid, highly skilled jobs on, on the basis of those new technologies including in communities that would really benefit from that additional investment. That's why Labour's plan around our Green Prosperity Plan is about our country being at the forefront of those jobs, those technologies and the shift that we need to see. And alongside but clearly that, spending less on it than you were going to originally. It was going to be a £28 year, <coughs> billion pounds a year investment. Now it's not going to be anything like that. Well, sadly, after Liz Truss came along, the economy is in a total mess and we can't go as fast as we would like. That's the sad reality of it. However... I do think this is a really big opportunity for us as a nation, but it's also a way by which we can cut people's gas and electricity bills too, and how we can make sure that we are uh, energy independent, that we are not so dependent on the import of energy. Well, where, we've been so exposed in recent, where we've been so exposed in recent times because of the war in Ukraine. Had we invested over the course of the last decade in homegrown energy, in renewable technology, not only would we have more jobs, people's bills would be a lot okay. lower. All right, listen, I know you want to go backwards and forwards. I'm going to stop you because we've got, how long have we got left? Is it six minutes, something like that. And I want to take this last question because lots of you asked about it. So I'll ask you to respond to the question and be brief so I can hear from the audience as well. Dan, Dan Ovens. Is yes. the proposed smoking ban a sensible and innovative public health policy or is it an overreach of the nanny state? OK, just, just to remind everybody, MPs voted this week uh, on legislation which would ban anyone born from the 1st of January 2009 ever being able to buy cigarettes legally. Uh, and there was, there was some legislation about vapes as well, backed by Labour, proposed by the Conservatives. Richard, public health policy or overreach? I'm not a smoker, but I think, it's, I think this plan is completely unworkable. You're going to have a ridiculous situation where people are going to be asking for an ID of a 30-year-old in a few years' time as opposed to a 29-year-old. It's an absurd policy. It's illiberal. All it's going to do is actually it's going to increase, a little drive up a black market, and I just think it's illiberal and unworkable. However much we hate smoking, and I hate smoking more than as much as many people. OK. Thank you for being brief. David, same. Well, I don't like banning things, but smoking is causing 80,000 deaths a year. It's causing a £17 billion hit to the, uh, to the NHS. And, and I, I felt that, OK, it may not be perfect, and it is going to cause problems. So when Boris Richard Johnson calls it absolutely nuts... No, it's not nuts. It, if it saves lives and if it saves money for the NHS, uh, and if it stops some young people... It's not going to stop everyone. We're not being naive about this, but I used to smoke. My, some of my children are now smoking as well and vaping. And it's also going to tackle some of that. The tobacco companies haven't been responsible... They've allowed children to continue to take up smoking. The people behind vapes okay. have marketed them at kids, so for that reason, I support it. Man there in the glasses. Um, I'm confused in that uh, it seems that all problems in this country are due to the Labour Party in Wales, but uh, <laughs> the smoking ban isn't. Uh, okay. I wonder well, whether Mr. Do you, think, got this line do you think the smoking ban is a good idea? Um, personally, yes. Yes, and the man behind you? Do I you... think it's a brilliant idea, I do. Um, it'll improve public health. And um, good thing. Let's just have a show of hands. Who thinks 
A ban on smoking um, or, or allowing uh, anyone born after 1st of January 2009 to buy cigarettes. Who think, put your all your hands down just for a sec. Who thinks that's a good idea here? So a lot, but not unanimous. That's interesting. Bridget. I supported this. I think it's the right thing to do. It will save lives. It will, uh, will save uh, the NHS money. I, I also support uh, further steps to tackle vaping, especially around young people. I think we've been far too slow as a country to tackle that, not least given that many of these products are marketed directly at children. There is no other audience for them but children. But I think this is, um, the, right thing to, this is the right thing to do. It's a good public health measure. Carla? Well, Greens want to see everyone able to live as long and happy a life as possible. And we, we backed the, the ban in public spaces back when that was quite controversial. I mean, Caroline Lucas abstained from this vote on Tuesday night. Why was that? Well, yeah, I was just going to come to that. So we, we, we backed the ban on smoking in public places, plain packaging, the advertising ban. For OK, but this one, let's so talk on. about this one. And our number one aim is to, is to reduce the number of people who are dying from okay, smoking. OK, so why did she the abstain? The question in my mind, and I actually haven't discussed this with Caroline, but I suspect the question in her mind as well, is will this work in the way it's intended? Because in 20, 30 years, how will they be able to tell the difference between a 45 and a 46 year old? I, you know, if, if the evidence is there that that will work and the government has thought about how that will be enforced and that is found to be, you know, I, I want to hear from the public health experts. If that is found to be the best way of doing it, then fine. But I just have a slight concern about how it'll work. The other concern in my mind is that sometimes prohibition has unintended side effects. So we've seen from the war on drugs in the UK and the US, we, we saw, you know, years, a very long time ago from, from the era of alcohol prohibition in the US that sometimes banning things has unintended side effects in terms of illicit and more dangerous black products. Market, than, that, exactly. And black market So as well, I would just have a concern and I would want to see the details of how that was okay. going to be tackled. Okay. And here in the black t-shirt. I think one of those scary things is when, when I'm going home from work of a day and schools are, are all empty, you just see so many young children puffing away on these vapes. Now, the data for the damage that's done with these things, it's very early days now, and yet I've spoke to people I work with who are like in their early 20s who've given up recently, a chap I was talking to the other day, and he said to me, it's harder to give up than cigarettes. They are right. so okay. addictive, so we need to do something, but the government need to lead. All right. Now, not all of you put your hands up in support of this bill. So I just want to hear from someone who, who, who doesn't support. The, uh, yes, the woman here in front in the green sweater. Yeah, I agree with myself. I think, it's, I think they will find other ways of doing it. Why aren't we looking at educating earlier about the health benefits of it in our schools more? We do that, though. Um, yeah, we do that. But it's, but I mean, what, it's written on the cigarette pack, because you yeah, can't really miss it. Yeah, but I think if a person wants to smoke, they will smoke. I agree. Something needs to happen. But again... Um, are we going the other way where we're telling them what they've got to do and they're going to do it anyway? All right. And the, the man there in the black jacket. Hang on, we'll just get a mic to you. There you go. I just love the fact that we're talking about banning something that we have a choice of doing ourselves when yet the government can't ban the 26 harmful pesticides that are killing our wildlife. Our, water, our waterways are getting polluted and yet that's causing cancer and more extreme on the NHS and yet we can't even ban something like that the EU are banning and yet we're not and we're meant to have left the EU to be able to have more control and yet since we've left they've banned them and we haven't. Why? Okay. OK, I hear your point. Sadly, we're not going to get an answer to that because we are out of time, forgive me, but I hear what you have to say. Our hour is up. We're back after a three-week break, and I have to say, everyone seems raring to go. Um, so, thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much to our audience for all your contributions. As always, the hour went too quickly. Um, we are, where are we? Tottenham in North London next week. So, remember, if you'd like to come along and be part of the programme, we'd love to see you. From gorgeous Buxton in the Peak District. From everyone here at Question Time. Bye-bye. <laughs>